Welcome back to part two of our lecture, Run Up to Civilization. Forgive me if my voice seems a little raspy today. I bet yours does too, if you're living with the generally horrible air quality that most of us are at this moment uh, in the state of California. Hopefully if this lecture survives in a few semesters, uh, students of the future will be wondering what we were talking about. But uh, I'm guessing you know what I mean. So as we talk about the environment and air quality and fires and that sort of thing, we're reminded that for our entire history on Earth, human beings have developed very specific relationships with the environment. And the one that we're talking about in this lecture here, agriculture, is a really good example of that. In other words, agriculture was not something that just happened. I mean, if you read certain mythical accounts, it, it may seem like that. But from the historical perspective, agriculture had to be invented. That is, farming had to be invented. And the question we've been asking is why? And at the end of the last uh, bit of part one, I suggested that you really need to see this radical change uh, from foraging or what we call hunter-gathering society. Small scale, small units, social units, you know, couple dozen, maybe three dozen people forming a band, um, you know, or a clan, some kind of, you know, ancestral connection between peoples who, who compose the basic social unit. Now keep in mind with agriculture, all of that's going to change. And so when we think of uh, large urban areas, for example, in California today, a city like San Francisco, you know, that gets shrouded in wildfire smoke. You know, we're talking about a place with almost a million people, right? So, you know, from the small hunter-gatherer bands of a couple dozen, you know, to the modern cities of a million or more. And the environmental connection uh, must be re-engineered to make that possible. And that's what farming is going to do. Uh, and so we have a tentative answer to the question, why farming? Now, before I jump into that, let me remind you that under no circumstances should we look at this turn toward agriculture as a simple decision. A simple preference you know like maybe one day you like coke and the next day you like Pepsi no not like that this is all brought on you recall from part one by an environmental crisis by the prospect of starvation and the necessity as they often say the necessity is the mother of invention the necessity to preserve certain ways of food collecting uh, to which our species had become comfortably familiar after the end of the last ice age. Remember, it got warmer, more wild grasses, more berries. People got used to not traveling so far to get what they needed uh, for food. Uh, and then it got colder. There was a drought globally, it seems. It got colder again. And so people were desperate to find ways to preserve that relative abundance they had had in the previous period. So all of this is being done in response to these basic shifts in climate change. But there's no question that farming would offer certain advantages for those who preferred now to stay put, that is, to begin domesticating what had formerly been uh, wild uh, grasses, wild berries, etc. Uh, to begin domesticating those formerly wild food crops or food plants and to turn them now into food crops, that is, those sources of food that could be deliberately produced. Uh, and here's one of the immediate reasons. Calories. It wasn't more time efficient. It wasn't more nutritious but it sure gave you more calories. So the arithmetic of calories helps us explain this embrace of farming. 
Hunter-gatherers needed about 12 square miles per person to achieve sufficient caloric need. That is, to have a sufficient amount of naturally grown wild nuts, fruits, berries, and grasses uh, to be able to subsist, or for that matter, uh, animals that could be hunted for meat protein. What agriculturalists will determine is that farming gives five people enough calories if you have just one half square mile of arable land. So five people can subsist on half a mile, half a square mile, excuse me, of arable land, whereas hunter-gatherers needed 12 square miles per person to survive. So we're talking about now a kind of condensed concentrated ability to produce proportionally greater food in a smaller area, a greater proportion of food that would be capable now of what? Of supporting a growing population. Think of it this way. Selecting what we eat and devoting that thing, that plant, for example, devoting it to an acre of land so it forms 90% instead of 0.1% of that acre's biomass. That acre can now feed 10 to 100 times the number of people than hunter-gathering. So basically you're taking all that food that was spread out before and you're putting it into a much smaller area, but from that smaller area you can feed many more people. No wonder it must have seemed like a miracle because it inverses all the relationships. Before, fewer people needed more land. Now, more people need fewer land, at least for food production. The miracle of agriculture, you might say. That's why we call it the agricultural revolution for that reason and other reasons that we're going to see. Now, again, when I use words like miracle and revolution, am I necessarily suggesting that mankind is better off for having done these things? Well, if you've been paying attention, you're going to know that I want you to withhold your judgment. Because as we'll see, mo money, mo problems. In other words, you create progress, you create new problems as well. There are no easy fixes in human history. Now, there were more domesticatable animals, however, if you were willing to tame them, herd them, tend them in the same local area. Here's what I mean. There are a certain number of animal species in the world, and the number really hasn't changed very much from 10,000 years ago, that are actually domesticatable. I mean, think about it. Think about the big carnivores of Africa. You know, the lions, uh, the um, Cats, the big, the big, the big predators, right? In, in in Africa, they call them the big five, uh, and lions, obviously at the, at the top. But so too, like hyenas and wild dogs. Heck, even hippopotamuses kill more people every year uh, than uh, virtually any other single animal species uh, in Africa. But you never see any of those predator animals, you know. You never see a leopard, for example, which is one of the big five. You never see one with a saddle on it, you know. You never see one herded in a corral, you know, unless it's some goofy tiger land exhibit, you know. But not in the natural, uh, not in the natural world. And by the way, there's a real difference even between uh, those who claim they can tame big cats, right? Uh, and those who say they can domesticate them, because you can't domesticate them. You might subdue them through feeding, uh, but that's uh, more like uh, a kind of nominal taming, taming. You're not domesticate. Domestication means that you have essentially conditioned these animals to accept the condition of the herd and to accept your dominant status, you as the farmer, you as the herder, uh, over them. And there's really only a few. Uh, you got goats and sheep, 
pigs, cows, you know, horses, right? But not that many, really. Llamas, okay, dogs. Uh, but those populations, those few species that could be successfully domesticated will provide an enormous benefit in terms of calories and not just calories, but as we'll see, kind of secondary products revolution as well. Their furs, their skin, their bones, all, all aspects of the animal can now be used uh, by pastoralists, by herders, by farmers. Animals that converted in edible grasses. We can't eat those grasses, but cows can. Turning in edible grasses into meat, milk, clothing, even labor. You know, to the extent you could put a harness around an oxen or a horse and have it full of plow, you know, you're getting, you know, double the bang for your buck. And heck, even the fertilizer that comes from them, right? The manure they produce could be then used in the uh, growing of those food crops that we were talking about. Adding organic nutrients to the soils, in other words. So we have to think of the agricultural revolution as both plant-based and animal-based. And in both cases, the key to understanding it is domestication. In effect, making nature work for the specific benefit of humankind. The domestication of horses, believe it or not, initially done for food. You know, for many years, I had a little cartoon uh, pasted to my office door where there were like these two sort of Paleolithic type, two caveman types. You know, one guy sitting on a horse, another guy standing on the ground. And the guy on the ground is looking up at the guy on the horse and he says, you know you could eat that. We don't always think about eating horses these days. But horses were originally domesticated during the agricultural revolution starting about 8,000 years ago uh, for uh, as a food source. Uh, but then, of course, also became useful in that secondary products revolution. Uh, beyond meat uh, as a beast of burden and ultimately as a mode of transportation. So horses, yeah, well suited to work. And as we're going to see in the turn towards civilization, as this ancient panel from Mesopotamia, a 5,000 year old panel, this thing is as old as the ancient uh, pyramids of, or the pyramids of ancient Egypt, shows the other adaptation now that mankind will make for horses and that is in war uh, for many many centuries millennia even the horse will be one of the single most powerful and advantageous weapons on any battlefield whether it was being ride ridden uh, that is by a, a cavalryman or pulling as you see in this case a four-wheeled cart a war cart uh, and the author of this design, this 5,000 year old panel, shows the effect because here he has some hapless victim simply being run over uh, by these domesticated animals of war, horses. So yeah, this is, this is going to have far reaching effects. It's not just about filling your belly, uh, but as you can see, uh, the sneak preview here says it's about organizing human society on a very different basis. It's about asserting power. This was from the ancient Mesopotamian city of Ur. Now, Mesopotamia is that land we know today as modern Iraq, the nation of Iraq. Uh, the land between the rivers is what the Greeks meant by Mesopotamia, the Tigris and Euphrates River. And it was in the southern part of Mesopotamia where the Persian Gulf meets the, the marshes of uh, modern day Iraq. Uh, that the first great civilizations, agriculture-based civilizations, uh, will find their organization. We'll have a lot more to say about some of those ancient civilizations next week. Uh, perhaps war encouraged some to control the labor necessary for agriculture. Yeah, we kind of skipped a step. I went straight from domesticating the horse to warfare, but there's something in between. And it's this organizing of agriculture on a large scale. You think about an army, you know, and you think about a large scale social organization adapted for the purpose of warfare. 
Well, where does the large scale social organization come? Well, it comes from agriculture and it's that ability, don't forget, to feed more people. It's the calories revolution on smaller space. So now you feed more people, you have more people crammed into smaller spaces, which, you know, potentially is chaotic, right? Have you ever walked into a you know, a first grade classroom right after lunch. Chaos, I tell you. Those little kids are, you know, bounding off the walls. Uh, but in all seriousness, large scale human society only exists if it can avoid the chaos of seemingly undirected behaviors. Uh, that is, uh, behaviors that have no central purpose or no central directive. Uh, you might say that in creating these societies, we tame ourselves in a basic way because we begin to live under certain rules of society now. Here's that whole panel from Ur, the part I didn't show you. And it really gives us our basic storyline here, how we go from agriculture. You see the farmers down here in the left corner of the panel, the bottom left corner of the panel. And if you follow it kind of left to right across the panels, uh, until you get to the top and then you go right to left and here's what it's telling us the production of agriculture creates a kind of procession uh, we're left to right here creates a kind of procession uh, of agricultural so farmers of herders bringing their produce bringing their animals where are they bringing it where are they going well now we go from right to left uh, across the panel. The figures change. Now we have seated figures. Now we have someone look uh, looks like they're playing a musical instrument of some kind. And these seated figures are separated from the biggest guy in the panel. He's got a bigger chair. He's physically represented as bigger. Keep that image in mind, by the way, because it's in that early Mesopotamian civilization that you start to see the depiction of authority human authority and hierarchy. I mean, as we go up the panels here, we're going up the wealth scale and the power scale as well. And the person with the most wealth and the most power, not surprisingly, depicted as the biggest person uh, in the panel. They called him in Mesopotamia, in the ancient Sumerian language, they called him Lugal. Lugal. That was a title, not a person's name. Kind of like king or emperor. Lugal. It literally meant the big man. And it was male, by the way. It was patriarchal. So one of the things we're getting here in this new agricultural based organizing of human society that we're going to call civilization is a, uh, a new kind of hierarchy. You know, a stratification of classes uh, built around wealth and labor and property and power and authority and all that kind of stuff. And it's all connected, as we'll see as we go forward and as the panel, the great panel of Ur suggests, the royal panel of Ur, uh, circa 2600 BCE. Again, that's about the same time as the great pyramids of Egypt uh, were being built. A growing surplus of food, that calorie revolution that we're talking about, meant society could become more stratified, more specialized. Here we get a carving from ancient China that includes the beginnings of silk weaving, something that the Chinese will be well known for in ancient history. Silk weaving from the thread of the silkworm, which fed on the little berries grown from the mulberry tree in China. So a very sort of regional specific kind of agriculture that's developing in China that leads to a secondary product revolution from the, the, uh, the spun uh, silkworm thread now that can be used for all kinds of garments, of uh, uh, coverings, uh, even uh, in some cases uh, for artistic use. In other words, silk as a fabric woven by specialized artisans. Uh, and do you see any of that here? Do you see specialization of labor? Do you see people doing different things? In other words, does there seem to be a gender component?
What kinds of labors seem to be grouped around the women? What kinds of labors seem to be grouped around the man? And in the background here, notice the peasant, uh, uh, the, the cottages, right, uh, are also suggesting concentration and village society. You see technology here. You see wheeled, uh, you know, uh, vehicles of various sorts of of, uh, of of wagons and carts. Here's a wagon seemingly carrying some kind of uh, maybe uh, food storage containers. Uh, here's a different kind of cart. Uh, you see, uh, in other words, a number of the elements represented. And, and keep in mind, I mean, this wasn't a, a textbook. This was a work of art. So art itself now would suggest specializ uh, specialization uh, of labor. That is the depiction of human scenes according to the new ways of living in and of itself. The work of the artist represents a new kind of specialized labor. Yeah, I couldn't help. I had to throw in one. We live in California, after all, uh, known for uh, its wine industry. By 4000 BCE, that is 6,000 years ago, 4000 BCE, domestication of crops included vine grapes and fruit trees, including plums, apricots, most of what you see in your produce section actually, and the process of fermentation for drinking. So taking those fruit crops, like those grapes, learning through a process of elementary chemistry, so the development of, of scientific understandings, right? The fermentation process, separating the sugar, for example, from the fruit, uh, turning it into alcohol, uh, fermented, uh, that is, in a drinkable form. Yeah, 6,000-year-old winery found here in Armenia, that is the region uh, that is north of today's modern-day Turkey. Here's Turkey and Iran. Here's Armenia. Uh, Mesopotamia, we were looking at a minute ago, would be just south of that. So what does that suggest about the agriculture? Well, I mean, look, you get a good buzz off of wine. You know, it makes you a little loopy. It uh, can, you know, sort of immunize you, at least in the moment, from certain cares, certain pains. Um, of course, sobriety returns. But one thing our human species will prove itself friendly to was that altered state that altered consciousness, that altered physical state that the wine grapes and other uh, fermented uh, crops could provide. Uh, not surprisingly, if you got wine, you're going to have beer. So the brewing of, of beer from the barley grains grown down in Mesopotamia, one of the earliest sort of liquid concoctions. Yeah, so among other things, we get, you know, getting high. Uh, getting altered. That's also part of this early turn. Uh, now, I, I suppose that our Paleolithic forebears figured out ways to do that as well. But what agriculture is going to accomplish is a kind of systematic approach to things like wine production and beer production. People were making wine here well before there were pharaohs in Egypt says one of the uh, historians in the featured article. It also suggests that there is a kind of intermediate step between that domestication of food crops and large-scale society, what we call civilization. In other words, we don't just simply go from hunter-gatherer to you know, food grower, domesticator of grass crops or you know, of wheat or barley or something like that, to living in huge urban societies. There's a kind of transitional or evolutionary process here. So, for example, uh, what we call proto-civilization, yeah, I agree, that's kind of an academic term, but proto just means 
early form of an early form of civilization in Europe by the 5000s to the 3000s. This is still what we call the Neolithic period, the period of agriculture, uh, but well into it now. Remember, if we start the agricultural revolution about 10,000 BCE, now we're into the 5000s. So better part of four to 5000 years, you know, that's that's considerable, right? Amount of time uh, it's an eye blink in the overall scale of time of our species history. But history is going to start speeding up. But nevertheless, 5,000 years, considering we lived in the Industrial Revolution only 250 years. But what we get is this proto-civilization. We see it in different places. We see it around the Mediterranean. We see it in what we these days call Europe. Remember, nobody called it Europe then. It hadn't been invented yet. Uh, but what we can refer back retroactively now to old Europe, uh, and particularly what is now the Balkan region and Central Europe, you begin to see uh, evidences of people, well, settling down you know, of turning toward agriculture more intensively, creating those uh, village scenes that we saw in the Chinese artwork a minute ago, you know, with peasant homes and huts, the, the whole idea of a home, you know, a place that you invest in, you don't plan on moving. It's not a, it's not a tent, it's not a teepee, it's not a yurt. It's something that might have a foundation, it might have plaster walls. Uh, you're investing in it uh, as a place where perhaps a family will return each day, year in, year out, through the seasons. So we start to see evidence of this. And, and not surprisingly, we start to see things that go in the home. You know, little figurines, little um, sort of votive figures. They may have had particular spiritual meaning, for example. Uh, different kinds of pottery and earthenware and vaseware. Uh, and here are all these really cool little figurines. Again, may have had some kind of, um, you know, ceremonial attachment to them, right? But these all suggest not only uh, division of labor and specialization of skill to make these things, you know, but a kind of consumer base for them, a need for them, uh, a, a, you know, a people who wish to have them and, and will trade. We. We don't have evidence of anything like a cash economy yet. It seems to be mostly barter and small scale manufacturing. But nevertheless, the idea of exchange around more or less settled or permanent uh, uh, locations, villages, and that sort of thing. Scholars call it Old Europe in this case. And again, just some of the physical artifacts that have been found. You know, we said in the very first lecture that history is dependent on evidence. In this case, physical artifacts. Artifacts meaning things that were produced in the past that have been recovered. Literally, in most cases, dug out of the earth, right? In this case, a copper bracelet. One of the first technologies to utilize metal ores was copper smelting. So taking a metal that's found in the ground, heating it, pounding it, reshaping it, in this case very intricately, into a bracelet form, another kind of specialized labor, another kind of aesthetic ideal, I mean by our artistic ideal. Uh, the thinker figure here, because he's got his head resting on his hands. The female figure reminds us a little bit of those Venus figures we saw in the Paleolithic age. But the work here is becoming more sophisticated. Note he's sitting on a little stand, you know, or a little footstool of some kind, right? She has her arms extended on her knee is propped up. There's even the beginnings of expressionism in their faces facial expression suggesting maybe emotion or thought of some kind. So the skill of the artisanal work is becoming more sophisticated, more technological, the beginnings of chemistry and metallurgy and that sort of thing. All of it happening in this period, this Neolithic period before the full advent of civilization. Specialization and surplus also made possible the accumulation of growing wealth. Uh, you know, I've, I've told you, and I want to repeat as often as necessary this semester, we're not studying some 
ancient past that is dead and gone. We're studying our own ancestry. We're studying our own genealogy here. And I don't just mean in some abstract way. Think about this for a second. The accumulation of great wealth. I mean, if you, if you had to summarize the United States of America in four words or less, I mean, you might go in different directions on that. But accumulation of great wealth, that would definitely be one of them. It's already happening 6,000 years ago as these social organisms get bigger, more concentrated, more sophisticated, as the ability of uh, our ancestors to manipulate and re-engineer environmental processes, processes through domestication, whether it be foodstuffs, you know, animals, or whether it be through elementary uh, you know, chemistry and artisanry, uh, the creation of new forms of tools, uh, everything from tools to jewelry, really, including the structures we live in and around and, and the ruins here from ancient Persia and the royal capital of the ancient uh, Akinamid Persian Empire. You can still visit today. I mean, you know, they really built some of this stuff to last, you know, and it's a monumental scale. Right? You see the human figures down below. The monumental scale of it is also going to be a testament to the growing wealth, that is the growing resource base and the ability to muster together more resources than ever before to bring on what will become increasingly elaborate public works projects. But if you flip that coin over, and I like the coin uh, metaphor because it relates to wealth. If you flip that coin over, what's going to be on the other side of wealth? There's going to be inequality. In a way that mankind had never quite uh, experienced before, a kind of engineered form of poverty. Look, hunter-gatherers would never have been confused for what we you know, think of as the wealthy uh, set. Uh, today, I mean, hunter-gatherers live simply. They had to. Uh, their needs were basic. Um, but they didn't consider themselves to be poor. Poverty is an invented idea. And you can only have it if you have what? If you have its opposite, if you have wealth. So with great wealth, then, will come great inequality, including the engineered type of inequality like slavery here in ancient Egypt. You know, society gets stratified in a number of different ways. You get people doing specialized labor. Some are farmers, some are artisans, some are soldiers, some are, you know, grain collectors and accountants. Some are even, you know, kings and rulers. But some are slaves. Slavery was an invention of civilization made possible by the agricultural revolution. Think of it again as the flip side of wealth. It's, it's not that there wasn't any inequality previously in history. There were, well, differences in status, perhaps within a hunter-gatherer band, a forager band, uh, maybe between male and female, maybe between old and young. But these were mutable categories, you know. I mean, the young, they got old. Uh, you know, young men became old men. Young women became uh, mothers, became grandmothers. But slavery was a category that was formed and fixed by design to create lasting, if not permanent, inequalities. Nothing like that had ever happened or existed because there wasn't a material basis for supporting it. In a way, slavery was a great indulgence because for every slave, there had to be enough food to feed that person. And so only with agriculture and the calorie revolution could you create these new systems of inequality like slavery. Tragic, but true. And it's one of the reasons why we ask, was agriculture a good idea? And before you tell me, of course it was. It could feed more people. Remember that groaning earth? 
Remember that population chart I showed you at the beginning of almost 8 billion people in the world today? Is it good to feed more people? Well, sure, you, you would say, because you need more people if your city-state's going to, you know, defend itself against another city-state. But would you need city-states if you didn't have agriculture? In other words, we always have to take these reflex answers we have based on our own time and our own conditioned expectations of things. You know, like food comes from the grocery store. And we have to step back and we have to see it as a process. And what we see is that agriculture was a process that unleashed a whole set of changes that in effect represented solutions to problems that had never existed before. As your textbook author says, during the last 10,000 years or so, the agricultural revolution has radically transformed both the trajectory of the human journey and the evolution of life on the planet by trajectory of the human journey. What does he mean? Well, he means you know, societies that are growing in numbers, growth of population, concentration of people in smaller places, what we call city, and the evolution of life on the planet, not just human beings, right? But think of all the domesticated animals that have in effect become adjuncts to our civilization. You know, you don't just see that many wild cows, you know? Cows are pretty much domesticated. You can find wild dogs in Africa, but they're hard to find. Most dogs you find sleeping on the back porch, you know. So it's not just human beings, and it's not just, you know, mammals. You know, how about corn? How about the how about the corn plant or apple tree? These things would have never proliferated the way they have done without the human engineered business of agriculture. Did we use them for our own growth? Or did they use us? Did the apple tree choose us to proliferate its own fruit? I don't know. It's a good question. And whether it was a good idea or not, here's a map. That's what you're looking at here. It looks kind of like a checkerboard, you know. It's actually a map. Uh, at least the reconstruction of a map and landscape painting from a settlement known as Chetal Huyuk, one of the very earliest villages, human villages, in the Neolithic period that has been excavated in modern-day Turkey, dating back to about 6200 BCE. Think about that now. That's 8,000 years ago. 8,000 years ago, Chital Huyuk became one of the first assembled villages, as far as we know, based on the evidence that we have, based on the archaeological finds there. And one of the things that was found was this image emblazoned on a piece of animal hide. And what it showed was a rudimentary map of the village. All these squares you are looking at are assembled spaces, constructed spaces in the village where you would find domiciles, that is, homes, you know, peasant huts, and that sort of thing. They were becoming a permanent fixture now of the human social uh, landscape. There was even an area where the real estate now was marked off for farming. A place nearby the village where the farmers would go each and every day. Well, okay, but what are we really looking at here? Is a kind of satellite view of a very early village, a view from above, looking down. But think of it another way, too. Think of yourself on that ground. What would it look like from ground level? That is, the view, say, from Chital Huyuk by one of its inhabitants versus the view of, say, an earlier hunter-gatherer. A hunter-gatherer might have looked around and seen a few rudimentary structures, maybe a cave where people took shelter, but otherwise a pretty much wide-open landscape that appeared in its organic sense. But now in Chital Huyuk, you look around, and what do you see? You see engineering everywhere you look. You see a landscape transformed. You see boundaries of things. Things assembled in predetermined fashion 
rows of things, blocks of things, lines of things. A new kind of human geography, uh, you might say, imposed on the landscape. Were we fencing nature in or were we fencing ourselves in? In other words, what benefit accrued to us, that's obvious enough, collective strength, collective labor, agriculture, collective power. But what was the cost of that transformation? Loss of independence, loss of space, loss of free roaming direction. Yeah, roaming is almost a bad word in our society now. It's the thing a phone company charges you a lot of money for, right? This is all a new habit of thinking, is what I'm saying. This business of organizing ourselves into settled geographical locations such as villages. And the problem is only going to get more intense the bigger the settlement becomes. By the time we get to the cities of Mesopotamia, you know, we're going to see this existing almost on an exponential scale. Yes, there are benefits, at least those innovations and such that we like to think of as benefits. But yes, there will also be costs. And so, uh, my friends, what I'm suggesting here is that when we look at human history, for every step forward, there is a corresponding price to be paid. Nothing comes for free in history. So what we are doing this semester is we're, we're watching essentially now going forward a 10,000 year long dance between human beings and the environment, between human beings and animals, between human beings and that which the environment can provide in a form of food crops, but also building materials and excavated landscaped spaces. Between human beings themselves, there's going to be a dance. You know, when we looked at that war panel earlier, you know, the two panels from Mesopotamia, we'll look at, uh, look at them again, are the, the peace panel on the one side, but the war panel on the other. So the relationship of, uh, between human beings, between peace and war, is also now part of the bargain going forward. And how do the implication echo in our own lives today? That is from Chital Huyuk 8,000 years ago to our own Google Earth. How does that view from above look now? Yeah, seems familiar, doesn't it? Okay, everybody, that's all for now. That was part two of our run-up to civilization. You guys are watching the Jared Diamond video this week uh, and looking at that transition uh, to agriculture. Some really fantastic insights in that video uh, that I'll be uh, eager to read about when you do the homework assignment based on Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel.